Oh, I guess we are live. Wait a minute. All right, folks. Uh, kind of an impromptu because um, the YouTube was acting up. So can you guys see me live? Am I? All right. looks like we are good. I need some confirmation from the chat to see if um, I am live. Because, again, YouTube screwed up. Uh, Razorbike says you're live. GZL100 says yes. So I think we're good. Yeah, that was a bad, very bad uh, opening. So um, anyway, uh, we're just going to start over. Woo! Hey everyone, it's Alexander the Real Mr. Robinson, and welcome to the channel, and welcome to another live uh, live watch along of a Godzilla movie. And this week we are getting into the Godzilla movie that uh, was not only the Godzilla movie that came out the same year I was born, 1991, but it was also the very first Japanese Godzilla movie I ever saw, and uh, it is Godzilla versus King Ghidorah. And uh yeah, this is so this is going to be um well just another watch along. I don't know what I was building up to. Uh, but I want to first uh talk about the video I posted earlier today about uh the DC animated movies and where do I start? And uh for those watching live or in post, uh I, and for those of you who have uh given me recommendations uh, on what to watch, whether it's on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. I want to say thanks a lot. Uh, you guys give me a lot of recommendations on where to start, what the best movies to watch first are. And uh, the only thing I need to do now, because I got so many different uh, ideas or so many different uh, recommendations, I'm going to pick out the ones that have been uh, mentioned the most. Like I see Batman Under the Red Hood has gotten a lot of uh, recommendations. Justice League Flashpoint Paradox, uh, The Dark Knight Returns. Um, so I'm just going to pretty much single out which ones have been talked about the most or which ones have been named the most frequently. And uh, I will... Uh, get... On to that. Uh, sorry, blanked out for a second. Uh, but yeah, I want to welcome everyone who's in the chat right now. Um, the All the usuals here. Uh, uh, Razor Bike, I remember way back when you did the first review for this movie, you gave it your highest rating. Actually, I did not. You'd think I would have, but I, I'm i pretty sure I did not. I think I gave it my second highest rating. Um but uh, yeah, that's 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 in the past. Whatever. Uh, yeah, we're gonna start this right now. Uh, this is a movie that requires you to either own the Blu-ray or DVD, or I think it's available to rent off of YouTube or iTunes. Uh, I checked Amazon. I don't think it's available to rent from there. Um, at least I checked on my phone. Maybe it's a different story on my computer. Um, no, this video is currently unavailable. So, no, you. Pro I think you can rent it through YouTube, though. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is a movie that we're just going to hop into right now. And uh, so, yeah, I'm using the Sony. Let me pull it out here. I'm using the Sony Blu-rays that came out from 2014 when the Gareth Edwards movie was coming out. So, unlike uh, the last two movies, The Return of Godzilla and Biollante, this is going to start off with the TriStar logo. And uh, I'll just cue you guys in. So, without further ado, I'm going to push the play button right now. Oh, that's right. For some reason, this doesn't have sound accompanying it. Like, all the other Sony Godzilla movies have... Um, Oh, okay. Just going. Didn't expect the Ifakube score to come up that quickly. 
but that's fine. Two thousand two hundred forty nine AD or twenty two oh four. Since that's probably easier to say. What about the Marvel animated direct to video movies? I've seen a couple of them. I think like the two Hulk versus ones. I saw Planet Hulk like way back in the day, like ten years ago. But and uh, they people don't seem to make a big deal about them as they do with the DC animated movies. So maybe one day, but right now my sights are set on the DC animated movies. I say that's a pretty cool introduction to King Ghidorah with that uh, with the theme being at a very low pitch and now we're back in 1992 even though this movie came out in I believe December of 91 and sure a UFO just comes out of nowhere with a very obvious compositing shot Ifakube. Oh, that oh, that's they did him wrong there. It said special effects by um, Kapichi Kitagawa. Like they they did him dirty with that credit uh, in this uh, dub, or in this uh, the English version of the credits. The writer's struggle. Okay, who let the old man in? The old crazy old man. Oh, now they come. You'd think they would have stopped him at the main entrance.
Okay, just ch while the movie's playing, I'm going to read some of your comments here. Um, will you review Mortal Kombat Legend Scorpio's Revenge? Uh, maybe. Uh, m maybe. That's... We'll, we'll see. Um, do you think Godzilla vs. Kong will be the last movie in the MonsterVerse? Uh, I think so. Uh, because King of the Monsters wasn't that big of a hit. And now that the movie got moved to May, which it was kind of the bad place for King of the Monsters to have been released in the first place, uh, I don't see it being that big of a financial hit. I mean, it could be good, but who knows? Now, we'll get to King Ghidorah's origins later in this movie. I love how they're all so accepting about um, a UFO. I mean, yeah. It's like they're giant monsters in this continuity, so it would be weird if they didn't accept UFOs. I imagine Mickey, like, after she just gave her little spiel, she's just awkwardly waiting uh, for something to happen. I also like how this movie funny I think it's pretty funny that um uh this is the very first Toho Godzilla movie I ever watched and ironically it happens to be um Godzilla's origin film Like that that's pretty uh convenient like oh this happens to be your first Godzilla movie Alexander well lucky for you it's an origin story and then Helicopters just explode right there. Oh, 
Oh, I thought they were wearing masks. Just so accustomed to the fact that people should wear masks nowadays. I just thought those self-defense force soldiers were wearing masks. I say, uh, that's not the most original design for a spaceship. Disappeared without a trace. You mean you guys didn't hear the giant explosion that accompanied them? You, I would like to think that this UFO expert would just say, "I knew my, I knew all my pe friends that I call. I knew all those people that called me crazy, would eat their words one day." <laughs> Can I, hmm. Justin Toner, those aren't two bad movies to be introduced to Godzilla with. Uh, Mr. Shindo. Played by Yoshio Tsuchiya, who uh, you may have seen back in the golden days of Toho with Seven Samurai and a handful of Godzilla movies like Son of Godzilla, Destroy All Monsters... Um, yeah, he was in a good amount of Godzilla and Kurosawa films. Okay, so I read in the chat somewhere. Uh, okay, Justin Toner, you have not seen GMK. Ooh, this that is one of the best movies. So just just hang tight. We'll get to GMK eventually, but it's it's awesome. There's something so satisfying about seeing uh, the self defense force military or just organized with an Ifakube score backing it up. Like there's there's again there's something about like a Godzilla movie that uh just is enhanced when Ifakube scores it. We can't see anything. It's too foggy.
It's weird seeing these two, um, these two clearly non-Japanese actors speaking Japanese throughout the entire film. So I guess we're not quite at that point yet uh, with uh, 3D holograms yet. I know technically they're not aliens, but uh, by this point, everyone's got to be pretty suspicious about um, this whole scenario. I, and by everyone, I mean the audience. So is Kenji Sahara playing the prime minister? Because I know he pops up later on. No, he does not play the prime minister in this movie. It just says he plays minister. Um, he plays the same character in this movie and in Mechagodzilla 2 and Space Godzilla, but he's not the prime minister. I think he might be the defense minister. You know, when they bring this up, I expect um, everyone at the meeting to go, Godzilla will return and bring our country to ruins. Okay, that's that happens once every few years. Like, it's funny that they're shocked by this. Like... Uh. Okay, those look good. I don't know what, like, that must be sesame, that must be seaweed and sesame seeds seasoning, but I don't know. I can see a lot of I'm seeing a lot of back to the future jokes in the chat which by the way I know this few days late but happy 35th anniversary to back to the future it's like hey can I keep this and just copy everything that I'm about to write that's what I'd do if I got a hold of a book that I 
haven't written yet. Or just look at it and go, okay, you know what? That's terrible. That's terrible. I'm going to change this up. And the 2%? Okay, this, this whole part, I don't know why I'm circling you guys because I'm watching the movie this way. But um, the whole timeline aspect of this movie... Um, I talked about my second review for this movie on uh, two years ago, but when this movie's done, I'm right now. I'm just gonna kind of go over my whole theory on the time travel element and how uh, trying to make sense of it because this is just maybe I'm just thinking about it too much, but this time travel plot just makes my brain hurt. Man, there is so much fog around that spaceship. Yeah, this movie really does... This movie really does feel like something Honda would have made in the 60s. And maybe it's the Ifukube score that's making me think that, but... It just has that feeling. I love how these people are so nonchalant about this spaceship. They're just in it, and they're, there's no sense of wonder with them. They're just like, oh, okay. Or there's this look of confusion. There's a um, knockoff Robert Patrick. It is kind of weird that the um, uh, the future people, uh, with the exception of Emmy, uh, because she's Japanese, would speak Japanese throughout the entire movie. Especially since this particular series of Godzilla movies was not shy about having the actors speak in their native language.
Okay, that's... That's an interesting concept for this movie involving time travel. Like, there just can't be two of the same person at once. Wow. I love how he keeps us like they cut away too soon, but I like how he keeps his smile after he set after Emmy just tells him, uh, hardly anyone knew your book existed. Like, yeah, okay. Oh, these things. I gotta say, um, I said this in my review, but the door, these door rats, um, have a, I have a much bigger appreciation for the Porgs uh, in The Last Jedi, and I like Porgs to begin with. Okay, so... Like, is Emmy trying to play dumb in that scenario? Um... Saying that the Dorats will be good if we get lost. Or did Wilson and everyone else just really keep her in the dark on their true intentions? Like, I can't imagine uh, she'd be fully aware of their plans if she eventually betrays them. This, <laughs> you know, I just got this imagination. I get. Huh. I certainly hope so, sir. That is the whitest I've ever heard one of these, uh, American actors. Wah, wah. <laughs> that that's just kind of funny. Razor Bike says, I like the American soldiers better here than in the dub. Of uh, I mean, I refuse to watch the dub. I refuse to watch the dubbed versions of these movies. Um And by that, I mean the ones that uh, where Toho hired a company from Hong Kong to dub them. But uh, I remember liking uh, their dubbed voices better than their actual voices. But again, it's been a long time since I've seen this dubbed and I refuse to ever watch a dub. Okay, so that music suddenly just stopped. Man, 
Man, M11, M11, blah. M11, um, is awesome. <laughs> like, just say, like, how, like, look at that right there. Like, he's clearly on a platform and not actually running. <laughs> and then you just speed up the footage. Who would win? Oh, oh, the T-800. Um, I thought it said the T-1000 or M11. M11. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to like completely, like, I'm hate, I'm going to hate myself for saying this, uh, but M11. M11 would completely destroy the T800. And again, I hate myself for saying that. Okay, I think the rocket launchers are a tad overkill. I like how the music is all like, it's war, but it, there's something about it that just feels incredibly jolly about that battle sequence, even though, again, it's World War II. Huh? And then suddenly when the Godzilla Saurus shows up, uh, uh, it's the score is dark and ominous. Huh? Uh, later, uh, Gzilla 100, but right now, this is Rodan's Old Roar from 1956. This is actually, this point of the movie is actually one of the biggest, uh, controversies. Um, one of the biggest controversies about this movie is that, like, how the Godzilla Saurus, like, seems to harm these American soldiers but uh, leaves the Japanese soldiers alone at least that's the biggest con at least that's what I get when people talk about a controversy with this but honestly like when you really think about it um, both sides uh, America and Japan stopped firing at each other once they heard the Godzilla Saurus and the Americans as because we're just stupid gun ho uh, they decided to shoot uh, the Godzilla Saurus, whereas the Japanese tr decided to hide and stay out of the Godzilla Saurus's way. So um, I don't see it as all that controversial. <laughs> oh, A what? Just like in Jaws. <laughs> A dinosaur? Like th these American soldiers sound whiter than me. <laughs> so yeah, the whole time it's been um, Rodan's old roar. And then for some reason right here, Gamera's roar, like 
Why the hell is... Why the hell is Godzilla Saurus... Uh, why does he have Gamera's roar all of a sudden? Especially considering that Toho ne didn't even create Gamera. Again, like, he only has Gamera's roar when he's in pain. And then... And then it goes back to Rodan's roar. Take that, you dinosaur. Yeah, this, as an American, like, this sequence doesn't bother me. I mean, even a Shiro Honda, um, like, was critical of this sequence here. But Kazuki Amore's defense was uh, that the American actors just loved getting stomped around and killed by Godzilla, which I could understand, I mean, if you were an extra in this movie that had, um, that was in scenes where you were going to get killed by Godzilla, I'd, I'd be happy about it. No, the biggest, con the bigger controversy actually comes a lot later, which I'll talk about later. I, again, if you've seen my review from two years ago, I already talk about this, but there's a... I think there's a bigger uh, point in this movie that could be considered controversial that many people just don't talk about. American military people. Couldn't it just be like Amer couldn't they j just said American soldiers? It's, it's an interesting concept that um, Shindo and his uh, platoon actually believe that this Godzilla source saved them. Uh, um, so I guess that's where the controversy with this section of the movie comes in. Is that um, the Godzilla Saurus, like, some people interpret it, this as Godzilla Saurus is protecting the Amer the Japanese soldiers uh, on purpose when, again, I don't see it that way. I just see it as um, both sides cease fire once they heard the monster, but the Americans provoked him and he didn't even, and the Godzilla Saurus didn't even recognize, realize that the Japanese soldiers were there. That's how I interpret it. And it would be hilarious if the Godzilla Saurus just uh, <laughs> just snatched one of them up with his mouth. Okay. Um, where is it? Okay, Gzilla100 says, 
is the Godzilla we see in this movie the same one as in the previous movies or a new Godzilla? Again, I will touch upon that uh, once we finish this movie because if I talk about it right now, uh, my head's going to spin and I'm going to be distracted by the actual movie. It is weird how M11 uh, will sometimes speak English and sometimes speak Japanese. And Again, was Emmy aware of what she was doing when she like when she released the Dorats into the past? And of course, Mickey's suspicious. Wait, no, that was a good question. Answer it. <laughs> like she, like Emmy just went full politician where she completely disregarded that question. <laughs> like she didn't even bother to answer it. And again, was she, she couldn't have been aware of their true intentions. Okay, say, so yeah, that look there, it's clear that Emmy was not uh, informed of their plan. So here's a question they left the Dorats in the 40s. Yeah, they left uh, the Dorats in the 40s. Uh, ten years go by before the testing happens to merge the Dorats into King Ghidorah. So what was King Ghidorah doing that whole time in between 1954 and 1992? Like, was it just chilling out in Lagos Island? I gotta say, this is like, despite however you feel about uh, King Ghidorah's origin in this movie, uh, it's still King Ghidorah. Like, it's still as, as menacing as ever. Uh, Ghidorah's theme, which this is the last movie we'd ever hear this King Ghidorah theme because Bear McCreary would not bring this theme back in King of the Monsters. And this is the last time in a Godzilla movie until King of the Monsters where King Ghidorah is clearly the villain. And then there, like, here's a, hi a 
faster version of the battle theme from King Kong versus Godzilla, which I didn't even know this piece of music was in King Kong versus Godzilla until I saw the Japanese version. And for some reason, there's a billboard with, uh, I think that's Chili Willy from Woody Woodpecker. Like, that's weird. Okay, so here's, uh, anyway, here, uh, here's the big contra. Actually, I'll wait until, uh, later on. Yeah, Emmy clearly was not in on this plan. Uh, anyway. Hey, Mr. Robinson, I missed the last watch along and wanted to ask where you got your copy of Godzilla vs. Biollante on Blu-ray. I can't find it anywhere. I got it on Bards and Noble, uh, like the month it came out in 2012. Uh, and it was like under $10. But uh, nowadays, I don't know how much it is. Oh no, Razorbike says the sk the disc is skipping. There is Final Wars, but the one isn't exactly King Ghidorah. That that doesn't count. Kaiser Ghidorah is a completely different monster. And King Ghidorah would appear in Rebirth of Mothra 3, but that's not a Godzilla movie. So again, I don't count that. Okay, so here's where we get the rundown of their master plan. Hmm. Okay, I mean, they'll they'll talk about this uh this plot point that just came up. Okay, yeah, they'll they'll discuss more about this plan later on, but this is where this is honestly where the bigger controversy comes in for me with this movie. Um, the fact that, and again, this goes into uh, Kazuki Amore's weird habit of uh, making the human villains uh, any race but Japanese. Uh, this is pretty much like like this could this whole movie or at least up until a certain point could be a giant metaphor for um like american colonization like the americans uh like these people from the future who are clearly american create king ghidorah to um basically destroy japan and then later on they'll show uh, the Japanese, the proper way to rebuild the country. And, uh, well, marriage. <laughs> wow, just drop that marriage bomb right away. That, that's called breaking and entering. Uh, 
but yeah, it's um, like it's clear that. Well, they'll explain it right here. Okay, so Japan pretty much um, becomes like this big superpower nation in the 22nd century. And then you have these Americans come in to pretty much destroy Japan in the past before they even uh, get to the point where they can, where Japan can become a super nation. Because all nuclear weapons are banned. Boy, that would be a great world to live in. Wouldn't that be, would that just be amazing? Th this footage of, um, that King, G King Ghidorah is destroying, um, is stock footage from an older movie. Um, and they just like edit in, put in the gravity beams in post. But yeah, I think, um, I think that element of the movie where it's these Americans that come in to use King Ghidorah to destroy Japan and then show the Japanese how to rebuild the country. I think it's, um, I think that's the bigger point of controversy than all the World War II stuff. And then there's this, there's like a, an argument to be had that King Ghidorah resembles, represent in this movie, King Ghidorah represents American colonialism and Godzilla represents Japan protecting itself huh? but then again later down the line once godzilla starts his rampaging through japan that that idea of the metaphor just kind of goes out the window but um i mean it's like it's like i'm not wildly offended by that aspect uh, and uh it's always cool to find a deeper meaning in these movies even if it's kind of exaggerated or not well thought out but again i'm surprised that that's not the bigger controversy about this movie that uh but the world war ii stuff is There's Godzilla in the ocean. Yeah, once again, Mickey in this movie, I think she has more to do this time around than the last movie, but she kind of really is there just to alert the other characters where Godzilla is and if he's attacking.
I'm just reading all your comments right here. Um, if this movie didn't have time travel in it, well, time travel is essential to this movie. Without it, there'd be no movie. No King Ghidorah, like, I, I don't know. Yeah, in the late 80s, early 90s, when everyone thought Japan was going to be a super powerful superpower before the bubble burst. Looking back, it's funny, all this worry about Japan being an economic superpower by the start of the 21st century, and it didn't happen. In fact, Japan went through a recession instead. That's interesting. Okay, so that actually adds a little more context to um, to like the to uh, the themes be behind this movie, and it actually makes it a little more interesting, even if there's some outright goofy stuff in this movie, like this sequence right here coming up. Hmm. It would be funny if M11 just smiled and just waved right before attacking and ripping that door off. There is a pile of boxes. It's a good thing Kazuki Amore is familiar with all these like tropes of other movies. Like M11, like he rips up that perfectly good um uh sports coat and then um that <laughs> that happens. I love that shot where it's just like a close-up on M. Levin's face. And he's, it's clear he's standing still and not actually running. <laughs> like, that is just... <laughs> Again, it's like, robot? Okay, I'm not going to question that. It's like, uh, no, no, they're not thinking that at all. Like, that, that's ridiculous. You know, I'm amazed that, uh, her bosses, like, Wilson and the other guy would not bother to keep tabs on her. Especially this part where she reprograms M11.
Huh. Okay, if you could squint your eyes, you could see Godzilla walking in the in the distance. It's a it's a little faint. Um but you could see it. And there he is. We are an hour and two minutes in. Uh, Godzilla's just attacked the submarine. Wait, thanks to the internet, I can never take Godzilla's big reveal with the helicopter seriously anymore. Wait, in this movie? Bomp. It didn't even hit his head that hard. Like, I, I, I don't know what, like, I don't know how that scene, uh, when Godzilla emerges from the water is ruined. But I know there's one moment in this movie that, uh, it's probably my favorite out of context uh, gif when it comes to Godzilla. Some guys yell at some cats. Uh, no, I haven't. I probably gonna have to take a look at it later because I'm not gonna let this moment uh, be ruined. That theme never gets old. Here, here's a crazy theory. What if Godzilla never actually left? And here's the... Um, there's the... Uh, chase music from the original Rodan. Like, there's a similar scene in Rodan where uh, fighter jets are chasing down Rodan, and this music plays. Now, for those tiny missiles, uh, they're causing some big explosion, ex big explosions on Ghidorah. I like how the model work has gotten so good since the Showa era that it's honestly sometimes it's easy to tell what planes are fake and what are which planes are real. But um it's convinc like the models look convincing enough to where I truly believe they blew up planes. Yeah, that's a model, but it looks pretty good. Until it blows up. Real footage. Real footage. Model. Model again.
Godzilla looks so much meaner in this movie than <clears throat> in the last one. I mean, this design's like... It's like there are minimal changes to this design throughout the movies, but this is probably the one where he looks the meanest in the Heisei era. Mooing intensifies. Again, like, that's my favorite out-of-context Godzilla gif, uh, where there's a subtitle that says mooing intensifies when he walks by the cows. I wonder if that was supposed to be a reference to Godzilla's original appearance in the 1954 movie, where... The original idea was Godzilla was going to come over the mountain on Odo Island uh, with a cow in his mouth. Uh. That had to be a callback. And now here comes probably my favorite monster fight in the entire franchise. It's hard. I mean, I made an entire video about this last year on what my favorite monster battle is. And maybe nostalgia plays a factor into this. Again, since it's the first Japanese Godzilla movie I saw. But this one is always... This fight has always been one of my favorites. Because it's Godzilla fighting King Ghidorah... And there's something about the fight that just seems incredibly brutal than most of the other times they fought, at least until uh, King of the Monsters. Again, the music definitely helps make this fight awesome. Even if there are a few unconvincing special effects shots. Uh. Like, it is kind of weird when King Ghidorah flies... Uh how his tails don't move around like they're just kind of stuck in this position like his tails are moving there but that's a prop that they made specifically for when King Ghidorah flies I'm talking about when they actually lift the suit up in the air by strings huh? Yeah, the wire work on King Ghidorah this time around is so... Like, like it's clear as time went on, uh, they had a better idea of how to control King Ghidorah to where it just didn't look like his heads were wobbling all over the place. Like, that prop right there, that Ghidorah prop is not the most convincing. Kick. Yeah, like that, the suit right there, the wire work on the suit there. 
uh, so much more convincing than the ones back in the Tsuburaya days. Yeah, that, like, some shots where King Ghidorah's jumping up in the air, not, I don't know. <laughs> Make my day. Boom. Considering that Kazuki and Morty, lo it, like, loves American films, which is clear by the mo Godzilla movies that he directs and even just writes, that's got to be a line from some other American movie, like Dirty Harry or something. Okay, this moment, like, I wonder if Ken Satsuma was so happy to do this, considering that he was Hedora, and Nakajima did this exact same thing to him in Godzilla vs. Hedora when Nakajima was playing Godzilla. So now that Ken Satsuma is Godzilla, he must have gotten a joy to do that move. Okay, wow, I was right about the Dirty Harry line. Boy, th this spaceship went all out. Um, this spaceship went all out with their sparks. Sure, just walk right underneath the sparks without a helmet. <laughs> Here I am. Wait, what main guy? Wilson, because Wilson? he's been talking Japanese throughout the entirety of this movie. Yeah, the two the two villains here speak Japanese in the Japanese version. Because if you're watching the dub, you could clearly tell that their lips are not matching the dialogue. Yeah, this plot is this plot and their plan is just so confusing. But again, I'm going to go down my whole spiel on how to try to make sense of this uh timeline. Okay, these two guys here uh, that have been controlling King Ghidorah, for the longest time, um, I thought they looked like Frankie Muniz. And then here comes M11 to kick some ass in the most ridiculous way possible. Yeah, those two guys, don't they kind of look like Frankie Muniz from Malcolm in the Middle? Or maybe that's just me. Huh. Nice leather jacket. Yeah, like that throw didn't look in Again, I love this fight, but that throw didn't look entirely convincing. Yeah, it's near the end of this fight where things get incredibly brutal. Because, like, one thing that King Ghidorah, they could do back in the Showa era was have King Ghidorah, like, his heads be serpent-like towards Godzilla and wrap around him. Even though that, they could have not done a close-up for that. Again, those sparks are just playing ev playing. Those sparks are just everywhere.
So yeah, right here, yeah, Godzilla's foaming at the mouth because Ghidorah's suffocating him. I always love that atomic shockwave. And then this happens. Ghidorah gets decapitated. Which I... Is that the first... Do we count Hedora as the first monster to be, like, dismembered by Godzilla in any way? I think we do because... I think we do count that. Otherwise, um, this is the probably the first time Godzilla has ever dismembered a monster. And then Godzilla just turns around casually like, what is this? Oh, shit. Like, I just love how they... Like, like that's gonna do anything. <laughs> you know, in the past movies, um, when King Ghidorah would retreat, Godzilla would just watch him fly away. Uh? But no, this, this time around, Godzilla is not... is not letting that happen, huh? Yeah. I think what also makes that fight a lot better, or one of my favorites, is that, um, like, this is the only movie up until, um, yeah, this is the only Godzilla movie where he and King Ghidorah have an actual one on one fight with no other monsters in the fray. So I think that's what, uh, that, I think that's what makes that fight so much better for me. So getting back to like, like some of the themes you could look at with this movie. Um, yeah, like for throughout most of the movie, you could make it could have made the argument that King Ghidorah resembles American colonialism and just how we have this weird. Uh, need to get involved with other countries' businesses, and Godzilla represents Japan defending itself. But now we're at the last 20, 20 minutes of the movie, and uh, that theory just kind of goes out the window because now Godzilla starts going on a rampage. As uh, Razorbike puts it, uh, uh, th there's this mentality of, Yes, Godzilla won, and then, oh, crap, Godzilla won. Okay, there's an extra uh, in one of these shots who's, like, yeah, there's, like, a couple people there. Um, as the crowds are running away from Godzilla, there are a few people in those crowds that are just going about their regular day, like, like nothing's happening. And now we're back to our regularly scheduled Godzilla Rampage. Yeah, I don't think, um, while all this is going on, I don't think I ever talked about, like, my experience of seeing this for the first time because um okay so uh last week i did i was invited to a watch along of roland emmerich's godzilla i'll um 
which I'll still be doing my own live watch along on. But um, I talk about this story on on that watch along, which I'll put a link to in the comment in the chat. But I was kind of like I was kind of encouraged by some of my friends at uh, my first at the first elementary school I went to to watch Roland Emmerich's Godzilla because it was popular back then. Huh? Does that count as Godzilla falling into a hole? Because it's not that deep of a hole. But anyway, um, anyway, um, once I finally gave it to like my friends saying, you got to watch, uh, the first, you got to watch Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. Um, my parents took me to, uh, the blockbuster that I was living at back in the day. New I say that as if I was actually living in a blockbuster, which that would be awesome. But no, I was living in an area that was in walking distance from a blockbuster. And uh, we rented the Roland Emmerich Godzilla. But then my dad rented, had to rent one of the original Godzilla movies just so I could see one of the original Godzilla movies. And I don't know why he picked this one. Um, I think he just picked a random movie for me to watch. So I just, so that night, I think it was a Saturday night, uh, I watched Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. And even, even back then, um, when I was, I was like either seven or eight years old, like it was around the time the movie came out on VHS cause I did not see it in theaters. Uh, even back then I didn't like it. Like I just did not like the movie. And then, uh, the next day it was Sunday. And there were, I was in Little League basketball, so basketball, Little League baseball. So we had a game that day. Um, we had a game that day. So did the game. And then uh, once the game was done, went back home, watched Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah and uh, instantly fell in love with that movie. I mean, I like this movie. It's not one of my 10 favorite Godzilla movies, but it's... Uh, it's number 11, I'll say that. It is my 11th favorite Godzilla movie. Um, but this movie definitely, for its faults, it definitely has a special place in my heart. Because you don't get, you don't forget, um, well, I mean, clearly some of you in the chat, like, uh, didn't remember when Godzilla, or the, some of you didn't quite remember what, the, what the first Godzilla movie you saw was. But, um, yeah, I never... I never forgot watching this movie for the first time and just like really being introduced to Godzilla. He ripped off the arms of Kamakris and son of Godzilla. I don't think, did he? I know he just burned them alive, but I don't think he dismembered. Oh, you know what? No, he did this. You're thinking about Ebira. You're thinking about Godzilla removing Ebira's claws. Okay, so yeah, that's the first sign of Godzilla like dismembering his enemies. But uh, I don't think it's as brutal as with King Ghidorah here. It surely isn't as brutal as with um, as what happened to King Ghidorah in King of the Monsters. Yes, because we clearly... Well, I guess it's a good transition. I was going to criticize them pointing out the year. Huh. Yeah, I'm sure nothing bad will happen there. Gzilla 100 says, What do you think of James Rolfe's Godzilla reviews? I like them. I mean... I had I'd seen all the Godzilla movies by the time he did his Monster Madness Godzilla-thon, but 
I like his reviews. I, I'm a big fan of James Rolfe. The only the only problem I have with him is not even it's not even a huge problem, but and it's not even angry video game nerd related. It's that he James seems so out of touch with like all the modern stuff that's happening. Uh in the like in terms of entertainment. Again, not not a big problem at all. Um but I do wish he was more like up to date with what's current in entertainment. Uh, instead of just living in the past entirely. This scene I've always tried to understand this sequence right here because like um I mean somebody pointed out here um Shay Smith says this movie is an examination of Godzilla of Japan's complex relationship with Godzilla how can a savior and yet how can he be a savior and yet also a destroyer to them huh? Uh, but yeah, this this scene, I every time I've watched this movie, I've tried to make sense of it. Like, like it's clear Godzilla recognizes Shindo, um, and the two of them have a moment. Like, is it supposed like? Are they supposed to acknowledge one another? Is Godzilla? Like, because you think Godzilla's... Like, Shindo, like, sees Godzilla as his savior. And do you think... Like, do you get the impression that Godzilla's gonna save him? This moment coming up, though... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh at that moment. Like, was it supposed to be funny? Like, you have this touching moment and then Godzilla just blows him away? <laughs> this atomic breath? Yeah, Shindo's dead. Like, is it supposed to... Like, okay, another way to interpret that scene is... Um, like, is Shindo supposed to be looking at Godzilla as a savior for saving his platoon? But does Godzilla see him as a traitor? Or, like... Cause clearly they they left Lagos Island when the God when Godzilla as a Godzilla source was wounded and trying to heal, so him killing Shindo is he, he mad? Like is Godzilla mad at Shindo in that case? So that's why he killed him. I think um, this this sequence here where the Godzilla theme's playing as he's rampaging through Tokyo, I think that, like, it's a weird moment, but I think that's kind of the moment that cemented my love for Godzilla. And then Mecha King Ghidorah shows up, which I gotta say, I was watching the trailer right before playing this movie, right before I went live, and... Uh, they they straight up show Mecha King Ghidorah at the end of that trailer. And considering that we have less than 10 minutes left of this movie, why would you... Like, nowadays, you would not show something like that uh, at the end of the... In your trailer. Like, the, Mecha King Ghidorah, by all rights, should have been something that um, should have been saved for the movie, yeah? Like, it would have been a cool surprise to see that Mecha King Ghidorah arrives and is now... Like, the role... In the same movie, the roles are reversed. Even though Mecha King Ghidorah is clearly a different monster. It's classified as a different monster. Um, the roles have been reversed where 
this version of Ghidorah is the good guy and Godzilla's the bad guy. But what, whatever. Like, yeah, it's... I do kind of wish that they didn't spoil Mecha King Ghidorah in the trailer, but considering the internet wasn't around back then, um, that was a cool surprise as a kid watching this for the first time and seeing that King Ghidorah would come back at the end of the movie and be resurrected as Mecha King Ghidorah. Although, you gotta ask, how did King Ghidorah survive um, nearly... Over 200 years in the ocean. Like, King Ghidorah had been in the ocean since... For nearly two centuries. With a decapitated... With a missing head. And no breathable oxygen. How did he survive for that long? But again, Why am I thinking about this? Like, I'm probably thinking about that a little too much. Man, Koichi Kawakita loves his beam attacks. Like, just beam attacks galore. Especially when you get to uh, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. Anyway, uh, there, there's a comment... That um, that I wanted to address. Um, uh, somebody, okay. Uh, Sean Clifford says, "Hey Alexander, why do you hate the first Godzilla movie you ever saw?" For me, I love all the Japanese movies, and I even kind of like the American nineteen ninety eight one. But why do you hate it? Uh, we'll get to it later. We'll get to that movie later. Um, in uh, two weeks, actually. Two weeks, actually, because Godzilla vs. Mothra, will, uh, that watch along will be this Thursday. And that's the halfway point of the Heisei series. But the short answer is ignoring the fact that. Um, ignoring the fact that. It's not a Godzilla movie. Like, it's just, it's not a good movie for what it's trying to be. Because I, that I did that watch along with um, uh, some people within the, um, like, Schmodown fandom. And it was just so much worse than I remember. But again, I'll do my own watch along and I'll go into more detail on why I despise that movie. They say that he went into hibernation when he hit the cold water. Okay, so... Okay, so in that sense, like, King Ghidorah pretty much went Captain America for 200 years. But he's still underwater. Like, he's not covered in ice. He still would have drowned. Like... King Ghidorah still would have drowned under the water. Um, Justin Toner says, I'll be skipping the, that watch along. I don't have Zilla on video, nor do I want to spend the money for it. I, but if you have Netflix, it's on there. Uh, so you don't have to worry. If you have a Netflix account, don't worry. You don't have to spend any money on Roland Emmerich Zilla because it's... Funny how the worst things to come out of the Godzilla franchise, Roland Emmerich's movie and the anime trilogy are on Netflix. That is a coincidence and a half right there. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, those... 
those grappling hooks. Uh, um, those grappling hooks are just cool. Yeah, it's weird that M11 is talking to Emmy through the um, through the speaker. Sometimes in Japanese, but that one point, it's like, um, Emmy, machine hand, hurry. Um, okay, here's another question that, again, I probably shouldn't be asking. Um, since Mecha King Ghidorah is not like Mecha Godzilla or Mechanic Kong, where it's completely artificial, um... Like, if Mecha, if nobody's operating Mecha King Ghidorah, at least the mechanical parts of it, like, how do the other, how do the other two heads function? Like, if no, does Mecha King Ghidorah depend on somebody operating it? And how do those two heads survive if there's nobody to operate it? Again, I'm probably thinking about this way too hard, but that's something that's always um, crossed my mind. How does how do the other two heads survive? Pulgasuri suit. Uh. I don't know what that's from, but I didn't know Ken Satsuma did that. You know, I do appreciate that they didn't try to... Um, I appreciate that they didn't try to put together a... Um, a romance between Emmy and... Um, Terasawa... Uh, but I don't think they needed to vindicate that with um, with having Emmy be like a distant relative. Yeah, that also explains why she had the book. And of course, Godzilla will never die. And again, for being the first Godzilla movie I saw... This is a great, like, way to end the movie, showing that Godzilla's indestructible. And then the credits rolled, and my obsession with Godzilla has begun. In the Japan so in the Japanese version, the credits would just keep playing through this continuous shot of Godzilla underwater. And I wish they... I wish they... We had the Japanese version instead of the international version where the credits just cut way too short. Because we, uh, we need to hear more of the Ivakube theme. Huh? Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Now, here's the spiel on how I'm trying to make sense of this timeline aspect. So... This could be totally wrong, and I'm sure many people have come up with other theories to try to make this timeline make any sense. I mean, the movie's done. Like, so if you um, if you all have other things to do, you can go because um, the movie's done. At this point, I'm just I'm just like uh, shooting the shit, as they say. Uh, so okay, let me see if I can try to make sense of this timeline. So the 1954 Godzilla happens. Godzilla dies by the Oxygen Destroyer. Then 1984 comes around. Uh, Godzilla returns. But uh, the Japanese nation believes that this is the same Godzilla. Even though we, the audience, saw Godzilla die in the 1954 movie and his skeleton got disintegrated. So we can assume that this is a new Godzilla. Um... So then Godzilla vs. Biollante comes around. Continuation. No big deal there. Now with this movie here, here's how I 
take the whole time travel thing and how I'm trying to make sense of it without the future movies breaking any continuity or not making any sense. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what character it was that said it in the movie. Oh, yeah, Razorbike says the 1954 Godzilla and the 1984 Godzilla are completely different Godzillas. Yes. So that, that's what we know. Um, but in this movie that we just watched, one of the characters says that the Godzilla on Lagos Island, the Godzilla source on Lagos Island has a 98% chance that it turns into Godzilla. Now keep in mind, like, yeah, 98% chance. That's a very high percentage. So what I think happened is those characters, the, um, everyone that thought that that Godzilla source would become the 1954 Godzilla, um, either, uh, God, I'm, my brain hurts trying to figure this out because I could talk Godzilla forever. But anyway, um, one of two ways could either go about this, um, Either they are right that that Godzilla source becomes the 1954 Godzilla, um, but they kind of got their misinformation, and they ended up teleporting that Godzilla somewhere. No, no, shit, that doesn't make any sense. God damn it. Huh? Um, okay, okay. I'm going to try to figure this out because I do not want to spend all day on this or all night. Um... Okay, so the Godzilla source on Lagos Island, um, they said there's a 98% chance that that Godzilla becomes the 1954 Godzilla. I believe that they got the 2% chance that it was wrong. There's a 2% chance that they are wrong, and uh, that's not the 1954 Godzilla, and they just happened to pull the short straw. And it's not the 1954 Godzilla. So they end up transporting. So the Godzilla source that they move. Um, ends up being the Godzilla that we see in the return of Godzilla. Because somewhere else, there's another Godzilla source out there that got irradiated by nuclear testing and i think if we're going by the origins of how godzilla was conceived in real life we can say that the we can say that the uh the bikini toll testing that um of the hydrogen bomb that unfortunately got the crew of the lucky dragon number five that uh created godzilla the one from 1954 Meanwhile, the Godzilla source that they transported in this movie ended up being... Fuck, this is complicated. This is a complicated thing to talk about because they, they did not really think about the rules of timeline, of time travel in this movie. The Godzilla source that they transported, uh, um, over time, like, just kind of mutated over uh, the next 40 years up until he would eventually appear in 1984 and return to Japan. And at that point, um, like the same, like nothing happened to this second Godzilla. Um, and when they, and when Emmy, Mickey and the rest of the characters come back, uh, from the past, uh, after they moved the Godzilla Saurus, uh, it just so happened that while they were gone, Godzilla just woke up and moved from that spot. So they didn't actually remove Godzilla this makes no sense. I feel like I'm rambling at this point, but basically I think, um, I think they were wrong about that Godzilla source being the 1954 Godzilla. Um, go to, uh, 5630 for, to, from the newspaper. Uh, I will look at that later on and who oh, no, Okay. Maybe I will do a separate video. Um, Maybe one day, not anytime soon, but maybe I'll do a separate video of me actually trying to explain 
the timeline in this aspect. I know other uh, YouTube channels have done it before. I think Wikizilla did a good video on uh, the timeline of this movie and how it tries to connect. I know Toho Kingdom has an entire um, like bio on the Heisei Godzilla and how this whole time travel element plays in, but I, I gotta be more organized on this. Otherwise, I'm going to melt my brain because this is just, uh, this is too much. <laughs> this is too much for me to try to comprehend off the top of my head. So yeah, uh, simply put, like as Razorbike says, by moving the Godzilla Saurus, um, they created the 1984 Godzilla, not the 1954 one. So that's that's the long run, and uh, I think this has gone on long enough. Um, Sean Clifford says, "Hey Alexander, do you like Ultraman or not?" Uh, I've not seen Ultraman outside of that one uh, fight between Ultraman and. Uh, that one monster with the uh, the frill, like the frill, those frills that you see on the frill lizards, that's clearly a uh, painted Godzilla suit. Uh, I have not watched Ultraman, so I have no um, I have no opinion on it, which is strange because you'd think for me being a big Godzilla fan, I would be into Ultraman, which was created by Eiji Tsuburaya. But anyway, I'm gonna get on out of here because the stream has gone long enough. Movie's long over. And, uh, yeah. So, once again, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you're watching this live, but you are just lurking in the background, not, um, not, uh, participating in the chat. Uh, Giras. Thank you, Spiders Prime. That's the name of the monster. That's clearly Godzilla with a giant frill. But anyway, if you're watching this live, but you are not interacting with the chat, I encourage you to interact with the chat because it's a lot of fun. If you're watching this in post, I encourage you to watch one of these live. Uh, even if you don't own any of these movies or you don't care about Godzilla, you could still come in and treat this watch along as just a regular old Q&A. No problem with that. If you really like what I'm doing with the channel and you want to help support financially, you can go over to patreon.com forward slash the real Mr. Robinson. And I want to try to do more watch-alongs, but exclusive to um, um, yeah, exclusive to Patreon. I want to try to do more of these live watch-alongs, again, because with the Godzilla series and soon the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I'm just doing these because of the pandemic. Uh, but if you want to help me keep up this Patreon... Uh, if you want to help me keep up these watch-alongs, but for other movies, go over to patreon.com forward slash the real Mr. Robinson, and you could get these watch-alongs for only $1 a month. Again, that's $1 a month. If you cannot support the channel financially, that's totally fine. Just uh, your subscriptions and just sharing the channel and spreading the word is good enough. And uh, yeah, Thursday will be Godzilla vs. Mothra, which is a big step down from this movie. But until then, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you, there's only one.